These questions will test your JavaScript knowledge and help you build confidence before an interview or a future job. Buckle up, because we're gonna cover most of the essential JavaScript topics. If you want to practice, pause after each question and try to answer it yourself. Best of luck. Functional programming. Using the built-in method reduce, recreate the built-in array functions, map, filter, every, sum and includes, as in the example code. So these are minimal solutions. Map, start with an empty array, apply the function to each element, add the modified element to the result. Filter, start with an empty array, apply the predicate function to each element. If it's truthy, add the element to the result. Every, start with true, because in an empty array any condition is always true for all its elements. Then, apply the predicate function to each element and use logical end. Sum, start with false, because we must find at least one element that meets the condition. Then, apply the predicate function to each element and use logical or. Includes, a special case of the function above. We do the same, but the predicate is just the equality operator. Closures, what will be the result of this code? It's 0, 0 and 0. Even though we used closures and each of the three counters has the method increment capturing a different value, we return the same number value each time, 0. This doesn't work like a pointer, it's just a primitive value returned from a function. To fix this, we could simply wrap the value in a function. Now, each get value closes over a particular value and we get 0, 1 and 2 from each counter. Again, this is thanks to the individual lexical environments that were created by calling makeCounter many times. Async await. The function test returns a promise. Will it resolve or reject? What will be the settled value? And how long, more or less, until the promise is settled? We can of course assume that synchronous code executes immediately. Let's break it down. First promise. The plain value 2000 is treated as a promise that resolves immediately, so it wins the race. Almost no time taken. The for loop. Inside of async await, each iteration is blocked by the await. We have three steps, so three promises to await sequentially, and based on the set timeout values, they will resolve after 0, 1 and 2 seconds respectively. In total, 3 seconds. Next, we have an await on a result of set timeout, which is a number, not a promise. We resolve almost immediately, no time taken. Lastly, we have a promise that also resolves immediately with a value final. We throw an error, but the promise is already settled, so it has no meaning. The final promise comes from catch, whose callback isn't even executed because our promise doesn't reject. Notice how we never return the final promise, so the promise returned by the function test resolves with the value undefined. The final answer, the promise resolves with undefined after about 3 seconds. Implement function debounce. If you worked with user interfaces, you probably know it. If not, it's a function that delays the execution of code by specified time, but each function call resets that delay, like an anti-spam filter. So if we call a debounced function all the time, our callback is never invoked. But if you stop for the specified time, the last invocation will trigger the callback with the arguments you passed. We must return a new function that may accept any number of arguments. That function sets a timeout on callback. However, any subsequent call must restart that timeout. And so this is an example code. How would you test the function debounce? A naive solution would be to manually check the current time and draw conclusions from there, but this is very prone to the imperfections of our JavaScript runtime. We don't have a guarantee that our code will run exactly x milliseconds. A safer solution is to intercept the built-in methods such as set timeout and manually progress the time. This is exactly what libraries such as Jest support with fake timers. In this example, we start by ensuring the callback isn't triggered despite calling the function three times. Then, we advance the time and check if the callback was triggered by the last function call. Implement function flatten, which converts any array to a one-dimensional array, no matter the structure and how many nested arrays there are. The recursive solution is simple, iterate the array. If the element is an array, recursively obtain the flattened array. If not, add the element directly to the result. Notice how this can be easily converted to a function using reduce. If you are challenged to the iterative solution without recursion, this is of course also possible, either with a queue or a stack. What's the difference between the loop for of and the array method for each? This is best illustrated with an example. We want to stop evaluation and return an error message if any number in the array surpasses 1000. Works exactly as expected. 
What about for each? The function couldn't care less about our returns in the callback provided to it. It will evaluate each element anyway. This behavior can be confusing. Here's the cold truth, just never use array for each. Make your linter forbid it. You lose access to control flow statements such as return or async await. It's confusing, deceiving and error prone. Implement function merge which combines many objects into one. It overrides existing keys and doesn't have to support nested objects. We can use the spread operator to keep collecting new properties and overriding them if needed. This can also be implemented with reduce. Or even better, just use object assign and spread the arguments. Are these two functions pure? That is, do they modify the original object such as initial state or not? No, they aren't pure. Even though we properly copy the state object, that copy is not deep. The house still refers to the old object. Similarly here, the state is a new object, but the properties house and people still refer to the old object. Without using a library for immutable structures or a deep copy, a simple fix is to manually copy the object on each level. Here, the state is new, the house is new, and the pets are new. Filter returns a new array as well. And here, the state is new, the house is new, and the people are new. So we can safely add a new property car to it. We could also use a single nested object expression, which does functionally the same, although may look a little bit ugly. Is there any problem with this pattern? Yes, you should never modify the built-in object or even extend its functionality. That name is now taken and future JavaScript version cannot use it because they would crash your deployed application. That has actually happened on a gigantic scale in the smoosh gate. What will be the output of this code? It's 20, 10 and 10. Our untouched prototyped object is the source of truth, unless the object such as A has its own property with a new value. What will be the output of this code? It's none, not a number. We tried to access the value from this, but this in our newly created function does not refer to our object counter and so the value is undefined. To fix this, we should use the update API as it was intended. We get the previous value from the callback argument. Or if you want to call the object counter, just say counter instead of this. If you had really insisted on this, you'd have to manually bind it to the callback with a function apply, call or bind. Lastly, some fun coding. Implement the function update, which allows you to set the value of any property in an object, even a nested one. So if you update the storage path a.p.c with one, then the value of c in an object b in an object a in the object store will equal one. If the properties along that path do not exist, that function creates objects automatically so that the value is always set. Here's an example iterative solution. We split the path by dot to get the keys, for instance a, b, c. Then we start with the original object and keep traversing it through all but the last key, so we get to the object a and then to object a, b. If the objects don't exist, we create them. Finally, we use the last key to set the value, so object a, b, c equals value. That's it. As always, thanks for watching and let me know how well you did. If you want to learn JavaScript and TypeScript, follow my channel. Best of luck and see you next time.